Welcome to Offsite Dirt. Today we are celebrating another show called Takeoffs with Edie Dillman at B Public Prefab. It is pretty prefab when we can talk about panels and experiences and those people that actually go through the entire process. And luckily for us, Edie has brought one of those to us. So Edie, take it away. Thanks, Audrey. Um, usually we're talking with experts. Today we get to talk to homeowners or clients or stakeholders, as you may call it. And um, Tanya and Sebastian, welcome. You guys are um, calling in from Santa Cruz, California, where your new home is. And uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd love for you guys to tell your story of rebuilding. And, and I will preface it that um, the beginning of the story is really devastating, that you lost your home to the CZU complex fire and and you came to be public at a time where you were looking for solutions to rebuild. Um, do you guys want to tell a little bit of your process and your journey and 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 what you where you are now? I think that's the good news is where you are now. Yeah, I can I can go ahead and start us up with off with that. Um, so we had actually considered moving. We were living in, you know, up until uh, the spring of 2020, we were li living in Santa Cruz City. And we had considered moving up to Bonadune for a few years before we actually closed on a home in April of 2020. Um, what we the home we purchased was a 1920 stick built. It actually had a sort of an arbor with a tree sticking out of it, so growing out of it. So there was, a, if you looked at the roof of the house, there was a big tree. The first thing we did was to remove that tree because of the fire danger. Um, and we spent the summer removing brush and, um, you know, there was decades of deferred maintenance. So we were removing brush and changing all the windows for double paint to make it more energy efficient. Um, and we just didn't get around to, moving enough brush away from it until the fire happened um and you know in in august of 2020 a few months after we had moved all our belongings into the home and uh the fire came and took down 911 homes including ours um so that that's how we ended up uh, in a situation where we needed to look at options for for building we were um clear right away that for us the only option was to sort of get up and brush off uh, brush ourselves off and move forward and rebuild um and so so we started looking at different options for what what we were going to do yeah and i do have to say that um what an amazing resilient community you know not everyone had the strength to rebuild but you guys um did and and went through that process beautifully very intentionally on what you wanted to rebuild how you wanted to rebuild um and sebastian would would you sort of talk about the goals of the rebuild um you guys did some improvements before um, you lost your home and then sort of facing a new build, um, you were pretty intentional there as well. Yeah, so the home that we had purchased was a um, 1979 era sort of um, just st standard uh, construction with really a ton of windows, a lot of out, uh, view views out in every direction. Um, you could actually see through the house in uh, in some directions. Um, and so uh, we did start off with the intention of uh, making it more uh, energy efficient um, and um, fire, fire resistant. We, this, this area experienced a close call 10 or 15 years earlier uh, where a fire came right up to the edge of the development. And so we had that in mind. We knew that it was a possibility, um, maybe even more of a not if, but when situation. Um, that summer was really mild, very, lots of damp, foggy days. Um, so we didn't think it was gonna happen as soon as it did. And uh, when it did, it really just created a lot of, just, we were just in shock. Um, and uh, the, the intentionality of it came out of the shock and into the just the knowledge that we were going to rebuild and um, to try to sort of make an opportunity out of 
a, a terrible situation. Um, so that's kind of our uh, the, the progression that led us to um, to uh, what would you call uh, it, you know not the regular uh, building approach. Um, someone in our area had brought up the concept of uh, uh, panelized building. Um, they didn't seem to. They didn't think that it was something that could actually be done for some reason, um, but uh, it got us a, a spark. And then we started looking into it and we found a few companies that did that. And then eventually um, we also just were uh, very interested and actually it was uh, necessary for us that the building uh, was as uh, green as possible. And that's what led us to be public where your uh, Google result, you know, when we searched on Google, it was uh, panelized buildings with uh, green building materials and the cellulose in insulation was really uh, important um, in leading us to be public. And uh, just went on from there. And we did look at, uh, you know, our, our motivations for um, prefab or, or prefab hybrid were just we wanted a more efficient home we wanted a good value and uh, we wanted to build in as quickly as possible so we could get back home. And, uh, you know, there were modular, modular homes uh, of which we've, we have neighbors now who have modular homes installed and they're beautiful. It's different, um, but uh, uh, to um, panel, you know, hybrid panelized homes. Um, and we landed with hybrid panelized because there was more uh, customization that we could do. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'll just reflect back to you. Um, I think it was our first conversation where you guys were just, you know, looking for information, asking questions, but I feel like I'm going to paraphrase um, that you were really intentional about rebuilding, not with foam or petroleum products, because you had this sense that it may build again and you didn't want to be a part of sort of the toxicity of of wildfires which i felt like you know in trauma to have that kind of awareness and to have a commitment to be protective of the environment and and sort of do better was really impressive um so uh just a reflection of a a, a conversation we had a long time ago yeah um yeah, now, yeah i i I'll add a little bit to that. So just after the fire, uh, I became very involved in sort of soil restoration and watershed protection activities uh, where parts of our permaculture community uh, would come out and do waddling. So and actually bio-inoculated waddling. Waddles are the sort of the straw um, socks that you put around, uh, you know, to, to avoid... Um, debris flow and things like that and so we actually hosted a workshop at our property uh, around 40 people came out to learn how to do this uh, and the, the purpose of this was to avoid the toxic runoff right and so our home burned down in August and we knew that over the next few months there was going to be rain uh, and we also was not sure when, how soon the debris removal would be completed, which ended up not being until March of the next year that we, you know, it was completely gone. And so we knew that there was a potential of toxic runoff from our home. And so that that just became sort of part of our uh, recovery was making sure that our our choice to live in the Wui and the wildland, wildland urban interface and having a home with toxic materials there's no way you can get around it right you have couches and you have clothes and you have you know all your stuff in your house you know even if your house is completely uh biodegradable you know you're still gonna it's still gonna end up being a toxic mess and so that definitely was a big part of our uh sort of journey into recovery of thinking about uh, you know, being up here, working in the garden, like Edie said, looking at the uh, at the toxic heap uh, that used to be our home and our belongings, and thinking about how not only how can we recover from this event and uh, uh, you know in a way that causes as, as little damage as possible to our surrounding nature, but also when we um, 
when we rebuild, then we keep that in mind. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the goals of building a passive home and, uh, you know, with these very thick walls and triple pane windows and, you know, doors that close like their refrigerators and, you know, all of that um, is to avoid it burning down again in the first place. Uh, and then if it ends up burning down for some reason, you know, that is beyond our, you know, all the carefully uh, measure, careful measures that we put in place, then at least we want to avoid as much as possible it ending up another toxic uh, heap uh, that will then, you know, um, affect negatively affect our surrounding nature as well. Well, and you guys have um, done more than just the waddling and, and, and training people and working with people in that remediation. You guys have continued to advocate and share information with your whole community. Um, do you, can you talk a little bit about all that you've done to share your experience with others? And, and, you know, Tanya, I know you're doing some leadership in housing in particular in Santa Cruz. Um, just what have you done and at what points of sort of your rebuilding process have you invited people to come and learn from you? So, so yeah. while during the rebuild, Sebastian was really more um, more active in sharing and, and sort of inviting people in. So I'll let him start and then I'll take over uh, once we get to the point where we actually move back into our home. Yeah, uh, we well, um, when we first met with you, Edie, um, we knew we wanted to do a, uh, a prefab or prefab hybrid. Um, but we weren't really clear about uh, what a passive house was. And you, you, you guys educated us on that. Um, and uh, as soon as we dug into that, we sort of became evangelists for that, um, you know, that process, that, that kind of building and, um, and now living. Um, so we were really, uh, you know, we have um, some very uh, active um, social media uh, closed groups in our area where people um, share a, a lot and there's a lot of sort of trust and um, um, care that is in those groups. And of course, after the fires, uh, people who lost their homes as well as people who didn't lose their homes we're sharing a lot of information. And so we put everything out there um, and invited people to um, the, uh, the days where they were erecting the house with the crane. Um, and we had a, a fair amount of people come out and look at it. And um, out of that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the other two houses that you built in our area were probably uh, you know, convinced or persuaded by, um, by that. And uh, I'm a little surprised that it actually wasn't more people who grabbed onto that idea, but uh, uh, you know, I do feel like it's on a continuum, and um, people are doing what they can with their own situations to to get more efficient and uh, resilient homes. So that brings us up to today, I guess. Yeah, so uh, so that was a lot of work that was done before we actually moved into our home, right? During the installation process and and all of that, and and then uh, after we moved in, or actually what what during that installation process and during before we had moved in, I I so I, at the time I worked at a, um, a local nonprofit agency who was active and is active in disaster case management. So I, I sort of. Just, I was already working there. I was actually in uh, what's called the Pogonet area during the fire, uh, handing out flyers to our unhoused community, telling them to evacuate because they were next in line in evacuation when Sebastian sent me a picture of our house having burned down. So that's, that's sort of, you know, I, I was already doing this work uh, and then our house burned down and then it just became, it came home, right? It, it really became... Um, um, one of my core, the core missions of my, my work was supporting others recovering, which became a big part of my own recovery. And so um, we uh, always have to go after grants to fund our work, right? And so, um, so one of the grants that I wrote for our organization was a, a grant with uh, Central Coast Community Energy is one of our energy providers here in, on the Central Coast. And, um, and they had a grant opportunity for education and outreach 
um, surrounding electric vehicles and home electrification. And so I wrote a grant to uh, get some funding for our organization to do this type of a, uh, outreach and education. And I wrote our home into the grant. So I just, uh, you know, asked one of our outreach and education opportunities that we would provide would be an open house uh, at our home with, you know, where we would have stations of the um, electric components. So we're a fully electric home in addition to the um, passive home. And so we, we have this sort of a map that people could go around and learn about both um, home electrification and passive home and so so i was really happy uh we were really happy to host this event uh last summer um after we had moved in and uh, yeah it was successful there was about 120 people came out to that event and and uh, there was architects from the bay area and you know people were interested in both the home electrification aspect and the passive home and so you know we're always looking for opportunities like that to uh, where our story can help educate the community as well and sort of um, bridge that gap with, you know, thinking about living in a different way that is also more longer term uh, in terms of climate change and everything else that's going on. And currently, yeah. if I, I just like, just... yeah, I just add to that is that um, not, we, it's not only that we're a fully electric house, we sort of went all in on, um, we have a heat pump mini split system for heating and cooling. We have a heat pump dryer and we have a heat pump um, hot water heater. Um, so it was, uh, and we have a, a solar system with a backup storage. So it was really, our, our house really is actually a perfect um, you know, demonstration of um, what can be done. Wow, 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 wow. Um, to have such a tragic event happen and for you guys to have such clarity and connection to the community is really super powerful. Um, the story just makes me feel that we have a chance to start creating more um, opportunities for not only connection, but education and to have buildings that are going to last longer and be healthier for us. And it's amazing that the two of you could go through something like that and yet still do the research, still have the enthusiasm to rebuild and to rebuild it so much better. What in this whole process have you learned not only about the experience, but also the people around you and your community? I... Uh, well, yeah, go ahead. well, you can go first, Sebastian, go ahead. Um, well, I would just say that um, the particular specific aspects of passive ho house building um, and design, um, we I don't think there's anyone in our area who is an experienced uh, passive house builder, um, you know, but it would have been nice uh, to have someone you know, part of our build rebuild team um, who was uh, because it was you know, it was a learning process for us, um, and it was a learning process for our contractor. Uh, so I feel like that's one thing that um, I would uh, probably it could have could have added to 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 our experience. Um, but we got through it, and as far as our community, um, you know, I think. Early on, uh, another person who lost their house uh, came and saw our house when it was still sort of, it was erected, but it was still uh, rough. And uh, she she said, you know, everyone has to do things on their own time frame and their own way. And there's no right or wrong way. And um, so you just have to be patient and understanding, I think. Is that that? Because I, I would like to just go out and tell everybody what they should do. <laughs> you should build a house like ours. The house of the future. Yeah. Yeah. My if, friend calls our house uh, the tomorrow Tomorrowland House of the Future. <laughs> yeah, if I can add to that in terms of the community. So I've um I started a new job in November as the executive director of the long-term recovery group. And the long-term recovery group is 
of Santa Cruz County as the entity that supports uh, recovery and rebuilding in our uh, county. I'm currently working on standing up the, our volunteer rebuild program in collaboration with Mennonite Disaster Services, who's coming in to build five to six homes per year over a three year period. Um, what they are doing uh, and and the other sort of builders for crisis response network, who's our fiscal sponsor, is another uh, builder in California and uh, also Habitat for Humanity. Um, are generally building stick builds, right? So sort of traditional builds. And so I'm I'm constantly looking for ways of bridging my knowledge and my experience from having to rebuild ourselves and sort of falling into this knowledge about how how that can be done in a way that is both beneficial to ourselves, to the nature, and 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 is less likely to to burn down again because we certainly don't want to be building a bunch of homes that, you know, next time the wildfire comes through, they burn down again. Um, and so, and I think there's a lot of opportunities um, out there in terms of grants, in terms of vocational training, which again, ties back into what Sebastian was saying that we don't have necessarily experienced builders in our community that know how to erect these buildings, uh, you know, so if there's ways out there, and I know that there's going to be people listening to this podcast who are architects, who are, you know, have agencies like Be, Pu Be Public, who have ideas, you know, great ideas about this. So, um, you know, I'm all ears about how we can bridge uh, the connection between all these thousands and thousands of homes that, that are destroyed by natural disasters in California. How can we bridge that with building homes that are resilient and, and future uh, looking. Audrey, you can see why I wanted these guys to come on the podcast because, you know, thank you. Um, oh. and you guys are very unique in that, um, you know, some folks don't want to know how their home is built or why it's built that way. And you guys have really sort of embraced sort of the building science of it and why, um, and the approach that, that we come to. And, um, you know, we're always learning as a company. Um, and I think being able to change and adapt and add more education in different ways to work. We have, I mean, since you guys built, um, we started a builder training so that people from around the country are coming to learn about building science and to ask those questions about penetrations and, and systems, um, but also to be able to do it safely. Um, so we are learning and adapting, but I have, I just have to say that most folks don't know what's in their walls. And I don't know if you really cared, but you do know, and you're talking about what that difference is, both in the material and the performance. And I'd love to just, I'd, we talk about Passive House. I know it's a little bit on the, you know, wonky side. But you guys are in Northern California. I don't think people think about Passive House for a mild climate like that. Um, and I'd love for you guys to sort of address that because you have, you know, filtered air in your home now and you've got really um, great windows, triple pane windows. Can you just talk about like your experience in an energy efficient home in a place that isn't freezing cold, but does have, you know, some some temperature swings and some weather? Um, well, uh, I, I have really enjoyed the passive house living. It's um, it's sort of all that we were told it would be. Um, it's just very comfortable. Um, the temperature is even, the humidity is even. Um, I'm a little bit of a geek. I went out and got a uh, temperature, uh, CO2 and humidity uh, testing device, and it's just plugged in. I always keep it going. You can monitor all that stuff. And you can just you can it's you can visualize what you feel, which is just um, sort of a steady, comfortable atmosphere. So it's very nice. And uh, you know we have uh, houses being built on either side of us. Um, one just completed and moved into, and the other side is still in construction. And um, I think you might have seen, I shared just a short video. Of, I didn't even know that there was construction going on. It was at night. And uh, I went to let the dog out and this just loud generator sound, you know, once I opened the sliding door, was blaring into the night sky. And 
just closed it again and opened it. I was like, wow, this is so great. Um, and uh, I would also say like, uh, you don't see them so much anymore, but there were there was a big campaign. People in our mountain community were uh, sort of uh, organizing campaigning to redirect the um, jet traffic because they were flying low in our area to go into San Jose airport, I believe. And, um, you know, we don't, we don't hear that in our house at all. So there's just, a, there's so much that we benefit from. And, um, you know, you don't have to have a dramatic climate to really benefit from uh, efficient house. And, and also I want to, you know, yes, it's mild, right? Because uh, I'm Norwegian. I'm born and raised. I've been here for 20 years, but the majority of my adult life I lived in Norway. So I know about cold weather, right? And we certainly don't have that, but I, you know, calling it mild as if it's sort of a stable temperature is just not correct. And that's what I thought California would be, but it's not. And so it gets really, really hot in the summers now, you know, as a, we're in a heating climate and uh, and it's our home stays cool. Uh, you know, we don't use a lot of energy to, to uh, cool it in the summer because uh, it's so tight. And same in the winter, like last year, there was so much snow that Sebastian had to go up on the garage and actually scrape snow off the, the, the panels, which is unusual. But I think we're going to see more of those sort of dramatic swings in, in, you know, in our climate year to year. And so having a home that even when the power is out for two weeks, like it was last year, we're able to self-generate, you know, battery enough to keep uh, keep everything running and to keep that temperature even inside. Uh, it's just something that we're not seeing uh, our neighbors are able to do. Uh, there was a lot of sort of freaking out about not getting propane for their generators uh, because trucks couldn't come in during the uh, the storms last year. And so we're sort of insulated from all of that anxiety around these big uh, storms that we're having, uh, the uh, big events that we're having, uh, because we have a home that can um, self-regulate more easily and keep our temperatures uh, uh, even, and then also with a solar and backup battery or more sources sufficient in general. Well, and I, you guys have been in your house now for a bit. So th these stories and you've had some seasons and um, experienced it. And I hope, I hope you've recovered from some of the process and really are settled in, in your home. And I, I do have to sort of remember that when the install happened, um, we had scheduled for the neighbors to kind of gather and see the last um, panels go on. And if people were late, they missed it because it was up in, I think, four days. I think we had thought it was going to take five days. Um, so in terms of uh, not bothering your neighbors, I think you guys succeeded. And, and it was really fun that you did open it. It really was sort of a block party of rebuilding. And... Um, I remember somebody carried someone over the threshold. It's very romantic. <laughs> of you guys were the first ones back into the structure and getting to celebrate at least that one step. Um, thank you. I think this has been a really wonderful conversation. You guys have, um, I think, shared a lot that our audience um, may not understand and not know the benefits um, that are sort of rippling through rebuilding well and your work and sharing. Um, this is part of that education. So thanks for sharing your story. Um, do you guys have any last thoughts that you'd like to share in terms of this audience and encourage people to think differently and build differently? One last really. thought that I that just came up for me and it's um it's an additional benefit that I think is often uh, overlooked. And that, so the tightness of having a passive house is uh, also going to be very beneficial next time we have either a wildfire in our area or drift smoke from other areas because we will not be impacted by smoke the way that a, a less tight house will be. And so we know that the air quality is dangerous um, you know, during those events. And so we will be able to go in closer door and take our masks off and, and be sort of safe. Um, 
uh, with the toxicity levels in the air. So that's one thing. And also, I just want to mention that we truly appreciate working with Be Public uh, so much through this whole process. Um, you feel like family to us at this point. I know Edie, uh, uh, when Charlotte comes uh, comes into our area, she'll come by and visit us. And uh, it's just, it's really nice. It's been really um, wonderful to work with you through this process when we were at a very vulnerable place in our uh, you know, in our situation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for saying that. Okay. And and it was a pleasure to work with you guys. And we did design your project as well. Not everything that we do is designed in-house, but this house was designed by our staff. And I think there was a lot of loving care of getting you guys in a space that you would enjoy for for generations. And um, it's so nice to hear. Well, thank you for um, coming on Offsite Dirt. And Audrey, thank you for hosting um, Sebastian and Tanya, great to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much.